You know? So many phones, Mira. I know. One is my drug dealing phone. <laughs> Hi, hi, Mira. This feels weird. We're in the same place. Woo! Look, we're in the same place on the same camera and definitely not looking in the monitor. This room that I record in is much smaller than it looks on camera. It's really tiny. We are super um, close. Yeah. Yeah. So we're finally here. We've been delayed this for a little while. We're here to talk about For the Emperor. For the Emperor. Which we decided, well, actually, it was voted that we... Um, it was voted that we read through Patreon. Patreon. And the choice was to either carry on with Ravenna because we'd finished Eisenhorn. Yep. Do something else totally or read, a lot of people had said, read a Kayavis Kane book. Yeah. I thought this might be quite a good palate cleanser after your first five books in yeah. of, of serious inquisitorial Dan Abnett. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I did enjoy this. I, th I found a lot of it fun. Some of it I found a bit boring, like all the troop stuff, okay. the army stuff. So now I'm a I bit mean, worried about Gaunt's ghost, which I understand is all army yeah, yeah, stuff. Y yes, yeah. But you no, know, this once I got through the first third, I was in. Yeah, and it is. It's interesting this book because there's very definite acts. Yes, like there is a setup because I think because for a 40k book, it has quite a weird setup and premise that you yes. wouldn't expect. Yeah. A, a, how would you, would you, you want okay. to explain this, the general idea of this book? Right. So when I was being told about this book, I thought it would be uh, very much, uh, I'd heard Flashman and Blackadder. So I thought it would be in the trenches, space marine warfare. Right. And okay. I was kind of dreading that. It's very relieved to find out what it is. This guy comes along. He is famously in to himself. He's a massive coward, always trying to get out of sticky situations. Goes down to do some peacekeeping on a planet finds out there's a conspiracy and it turns into a bit of a kind of like who done it yeah, yeah. The, the the essential idea is that Kane is a very famous heroic imperial commissar who is in fact a massive coward only concerned for himself and bumbles through his various assignments yeah. trying to get out of trouble yes which inevitably always puts him in more trouble in the middle of anything that's happening yeah a bit like James Holden in The Expanse. If anything yeah. is going on, it's <laughs> Kane in the middle of yeah. it. Yeah, and it's and it, he's usually in the middle of it because there was an obvious fight happening somewhere, and he'd he found a weak way to weasel out of it under the pretense of being some sort of special hero of the Imperium who needed to help in the this little place over there. Yeah, Kane's a coward and doesn't really care about a lot of the things that Imperial characters usually care about. Yeah takes the piss consistently out mm -hmm. of the institutions of the Imperium and all the things that other books take very seriously and then essentially ends up going on lots of adventures in war zones which because of the nature of them he's trying to get out of it aren't usually a big battle. No. And then the book is, if you didn't know, if you haven't read any of these, the books are told from the perspective of an Inquisitor writing up Kane's very frank and honest memoirs mm. but because Kane doesn't care about anything Kane isn't involved in they frequently have to put in the context, put in context in, in the terms of footnotes, or find historical sources from other other authors to put what Kane's talking about in context, which is a really nice excuse to put in some really <laughs> terrible writing yeah. for fun. Yeah, I mean, definitely, this book has been written with like a kind of a very like a comedy hand. Yeah, and I think the different voices really bring that out. Yeah, um, I thought Kane was really interesting as a character. Because Kane really thinks I'm cowardly, I, I'm running away. But in any situation, he, and we'll talk about this, he'll be in a, a really sticky situation and he manages to MacGyver his way out of it. Or, yeah. So there's, it's quite interesting, Kane's perception of himself, he's actually quite competent. He's a good fighter, isn't he? Yeah. He knows how to calm people down. He's manipulative. <laughs> So, I mean, almost the first act of this is him being manipulative. Yeah. It's, sh it's showing you how manipulative Kane can be yeah. to save his own ass and make his own life easier. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it's really interesting. I was comparing it to this TV show called Physical. Right. Completely different about a woman who starts up an aerobics class in the 80s. But the whole way through the narrative, in her head, she's giving herself, you can hear her brain. Right. Her brain is almost like this other character. So it's really interesting. You hear Kane going, oh, man, I'm going to die now. I've got to do this quickly. Yeah. Then you see the impact, which is like an explosion or he saves loads of people. And then you read the official write up. Yes. So it's, yes. it's really clever, very yeah. clever and crafted in a really funny way, but like with a lot of care. Yes. it's And I think that's one of the one of the really clever things about this is 
I've made notes a few times while reading this along the lines of, I have read 40k novels where the cane bits of this, which is this self-deprecating but very heroic sounding bluff old soldier routine, is done for the whole novel at face value. Mm. And the fact that this is within a framing device of the Inquisitor's memoirs, who, are, who which, where it's constantly commented on, yeah. sort of makes the makes you more capable of reading that sort of bluff old soldier military yeah, yeah, yeah. bullshit. It's, it's it's all played down a bit. There's loads of bits where he's like sizing up how hot the women are. Yes. If it didn't have that undercurrent of Oh yeah. Look at this asshole. It, it, would it be, wouldn't really it, would, it wouldn't be good. Yeah. And the great thing is, he's a very kind of like, oh, her, her dress clung to her about who he, the woman he finds out is the Inquisitor. And then as it goes on, her footnotes are like basically eye rolling. And like, <laughs> you know, he'll say something and she'll the footnote will kind of take the piss or say, well, actually it was like that. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. quite good to have that kind of back. And I have to say yeah. also, it's not just Battlefield. I was really worried about that because I don't want to read about the flank was here, so-and-so was yeah. there. But like loads of stuff happens. It becomes like a mystery. And you're like, who's doing this? I think that's a really clever choice because of... Because of the nature of the character is, there's a big battle happening, so yeah. fuck this. I'm going to take awesome. five people because I really need to investigate that uh, temple yeah. over there that he's convinced is a red herring that he's just going to be safe for a while. It means that all the actual action stories you get are him and a squad. Yes. Almost always him and a squad. Him, him and a group of people you get to know yeah. in a random environment. But um, I, I, I know we should probably talk about the plot of the book, but <laughs> one of the good things is, as someone who doesn't know that much about the Warhammer universe, yeah. I learned about Tau. I learned about crew um, and it just kind of felt like cantina. There were loads of different kind of aliens and yeah. imperials mixing. And you don't normally get that. If they're just fighting, you don't hear about their cultures yeah, and what yeah. they're like. Yeah. So I really loved it. And I loved learning that if you're a crew and you feel like being a bit brainy, go and eat a brainy person and you will take on their genes. And I found out if I was in the Warhammer universe, I would be Tau. Oh, really? Because they have like... Uh, groups and you're either earth wind or fire <laughs> and, <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so me and um, when i've made some notes here about the towel the, for, and the towel look really cute to me they've got long faces and They're like mm, blue blue fishy blue. fish cow people yeah, yeah. Blue, blue's one of my favorite colors and um they crave stability don't we all <laughs> and you get to choose whether you're water fire no you get born into it oh okay. yeah unfortunately well i would be a water so this was a really great book to see those cultures interact. Normally they're just hacking the crap out of each other. Yeah. So I, I yeah, enjoyed yeah. that about this book. We we should say we've lit the we've not lit the tower candle. We've lit the Tyranid candle. Oh, is there uh, a tower candle? There is a tower candle behind you. Is the Tyranid one? Uh, so the room slowly is getting oh, more and more. Of it. The room's starting to smell more and more lemony by the second. Yeah, we're yeah. citrus out. Yeah. Uh, we've gone with the Tyranid one for, for the gene stealers. Um, okay, should we talk about what happens in the book? Yes. Right, okay, so the book starts on a troop ship on the way to a war zone where Commissar Kane, who was previously with a Valhallen artillery regiment, which he liked because it kept him behind the lines. Valhallen's are like space World War One Russians. Okay, oh, yeah, awesome. Yeah, so that's why they like, um, oh, we've, we've got Tanner tea. We found our own Russian tea. Oh, we to did, drink. yes. Yeah, uh, so we've got some Tanner. Val tea. There's a lot of tea. He did so well there that he got promoted to high command. <laughs> and they kept on sending him on special dangerous missions. <laughs> so he requested another regiment and ended up being sent, which is where we catch up with him, being sent to this regiment, which are two regiments that have been decimated. Yes. Like been been uh, reduced to below active size and have then been combined, both Valhallen regiments. One is all female, one is all male. So yeah. then combined into a mixed regiment. And as he walks into the deck to meet them, there is a colossal brawl breaking out because the two halves of the regiment hate each other. Yeah. They're both uh, regiments that have been shamed and like shot down to like, you know, they've lost loads of their buddies. So there's this massive canteen brawl and our hero Kane's like, I need to get out of here. But as he's wandering off to the door, someone goes, come on to help. And he's like, oh, no. But the scene's really great. He kind of thinks his way out of it. He's like, you there, grab a broom. And he puts his foot in some blood and goes, start cleaning this up. And they're so shocked that it's not people shooting each other that they just kind of very meekly obey. Yeah. That was like a great introduction to how he's going to handle anything that comes up. And I think he mentions a few times in this that the, the sort of his his running narrative is, I've got to manipulate my way out of this. I'm very good at manipulating people. I'm, yes. I'm basically going to chalk them into thinking I'm good. And, yeah. yeah. 
you even hear like in the narrative, he's like, well, I know that this person will really respond if I act like this. So I do this. So, so it sets up him and it sets up this idea. There's a few people killed and the, the sort of ring leaders of this brawl are sent to the brig. It meets the commanding officers, mm. decides that he's going to have a difficult time of it trying to get them to fight together and proposes, I think, as part of this whole first act, proposes this idea that they um, become this one yeah. unique regiment. Um, there's, they, we also meet a few of the side characters. Uh, I think we meet Jürgen here. Jürgen. Do you, know what, you want to explain what Jürgen is? Yeah, so, I mean, Jürgen is a few things. I've written it down. Jürgen is Gollum. <laughs> Jürgen is Dobby the house elf. <laughs> but mostly Jürgen is Baldrick. Jürgen is also Albert from Batman, because uh, yeah. there's one section where Kane goes, kill him. He goes, you're welcome, sir, after he does it. Um, but he's a very, very, very smelly man. <laughs> Can I do the spoiler? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. I think everyone's probably read this. Okay, so Jürgen <laughs> turns out... I'm looking at the wrong thing again. Hi. Jürgen turns out to be a blank or a pariah, and I was so proud of myself. I knew because we'd read... We've watched Beckwin, read Beckwin. Yeah, so I think it, I think I figured it out, like, when he... The only way he could have survived his Tyranids mm. is because he repulsed them, and I was like, oh, he must be a blank. And he smells really, really bad. Every single... Um, every single mention of Jürgen is like, he smelled like cream cheese or the, you know, under the stench of his moist armpit. He's a really repellent character, which would make sense because people feel genuinely uncomfortable around blanks, right? Yeah. So, so you don't find this out till quite a way in. Kane almost uses him to disconcert people. Yes. So he'll be in a meeting trying to get the upper hand. Then he'll have Jürgen come in and serve them tan of tea. And everyone will be like, oh my God, what the hell is this? Why is this person here? Which yeah. will give him some sort of upper hand. There was a beautiful grim moment where Jürgen serves the tea, but puts his thumb and finger in the tea. No one drinks the tea. So a really nice kind of comedy. But also Jürgen is kind of the hero. He yeah, very saves, much. He yeah. saves a lot of lives. And um, so we meet Jürgen, we meet Kane, we meet some other characters, we meet Sulla for the first time, who's yes. a brilliant secondary character. Sulla is one of the main people who's annoyed about this merger. Sulla is also the device by by which we get to hear about the actual military stuff that's going on in this yes. plot. So because right. Kane couldn't give a shit about it. Yeah, she does the very militaristic plot. So we'll hear from Kane's opinion and then she'll write it. And it is quite boring. But It's it's like deliberately overwritten. It's yeah. a wider plot is that Sulla is this character throughout all the Kane books who is very, very annoying. Kane, Kane considers her really annoying, way too enthusiastic, liable to get everyone killed in stupid suicidal oh, charges. Okay. Sulla thinks of Kane as a great mentor and a great hero. Mm. Um, Kane is permanently annoyed by her and permanently tries to sideline her, um, which of course means within the concepts of 40k <laughs> that Sulla, of course, is a colossally successful general who becomes the first ever Lady General of the Imperial Guard <laughs> and writes her memoirs about her time, constantly praising Kane and overwriting the glory of their yeah. service to the Imperium, which Amberly, who is the Inquisitor writing the um, framing device, presents very apologetically as the only actual source for what really happened in the military side of the campaign. Really sorry for making you read this. It's so badly written. Yeah. And there's a great, there's a great moment. Sulla runs off and does something heroic. Kane's like, why the heck did they do that? They could have died. And Sulla goes, I just asked myself what the commissar would have done. Because <laughs> she absolutely hero worships him. Yeah. So, so we, yeah. we meet all these people. We meet Brock Law and Castine, the two commanders. Uh, meet Sulla, we meet Jürgen, we get a sense of the regiment, we find that the five people have been put in the brig. and um, Yeah, the five people who kicked off the riots. He's meant to kill them. Yeah, like if, the captain really wants them to kill them because they killed some naval armsmen, like yeah, security. Yeah, yeah. But Kane can't bring himself to murder them, so makes up this plot. Okay, you guys are going to be locked up. If there are any suicide missions, you might get an opportunity to redeem yourselves, but just stay in prison and work out until that point. Yeah. Which is definitely not foreshadowing. No, no. <laughs> By the end of this first bit, everyone's friends. Yes. Like the five ringleaders are in the prison. Kane has saved them. So he the, the regiment likes him because he didn't get those five people killed. Yeah. And he merges the two regiments by saying, you'll number this, you'll number that. Let's just add them together. And now you're a new regiment. And now you're a new regiment. Yeah. I think the, to the level of silliness this is, I think the original brawl was started because Sulla insisted on using the regimental, the regimental crockery. crockery because it was founding day for one regiment and the other regiment took it as an insult. Yeah. It's, it's that silly. Food fight! So anyway, everyone's friends at the end of Act 1. They land on the planet. The plot begins. Yes. So we land on this planet, starting off a sequence of this in Kane books. The planet is called Gravelax, mm -hmm. which is a fish reference. Oh. Because the Tau. Uh, ah. Yeah. The second Kane book is called Caves of Ice. It's set on an ice world called Simia Orichalcae, which translates as Brass Monkey. 
Okay, very good. So this is a running joke in cane books that people that planets have names like this. So land on the planet of Gravelax. And in the okay. planet of Gravelax, the, the political situation is it's a backwater planet. The Imperium don't really care about it. Mm. Um, a load of regiments have landed. There's other Valhalla regiments and, and other regiments around, but not that many. And they're under the command of a Lord General called Zyvan. Mm who um, becomes mates with Cain over, the, over time. The governor has requested aid from the Imperium because the Tau have landed and started trading with everybody yeah. and being really friendly. And they've also landed a fair amount of military might. And although there isn't officially a war yet, mm. and the Imperial Guard, the Astra Militarum have landed, are very concerned that they don't re that there's a lot more Tau than they thought and yeah. they don't really have the resources to fight a war now. Yeah. But the governor is saying, look, there's all these Tau here. Um, we need some help. Yeah. But also, uh, it turns out as they parade through the city to their billets, an awful lot of people in the city kind of like the Tau. Yeah. Which is a thing that happens in the background of 40k. There's these, there are Tau human auxiliaries who are considered traitors to the Imperium. Mm. Whole planets that have gone to the Tau because, on the surface anyway, the Tau seem a hell of a lot nicer than the Imperium. I know. They do crave stability and they're named after Earth, Wind and Fire. What can I say? But also, I was really interested. They're terrified of the Tau's railgun. Yeah. And I was like, I've only just learned what a railgun is because I watch The Expanse now. But that's like a really big, powerful weapon, apparently. Yeah. Can you play that? Yeah. And yeah, in fact, um, just recently there was the usual weekly massive nerd fury because railguns got an improvement and now are very good. Are they OP? So they're, oh, who the fuck knows? <laughs> um, yeah. We don't know. We don't know. I mean, it depends who you speak to. Depends how angry they want to be. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Tau railguns are a thing. Yeah. In, yeah, but I would definitely defect to Tau. I mean, I don't know. One of the things that humans have done if they like the Tau is they shave their head and just have the one long lock. lock yeah. They also paint their faces blue. And paint blue. their faces pastel blue. <laughs> um, so, yeah, they're concerned about the Tau have, taking a grip. But yeah. in the wider context, it's still a small back back alley planet. It's yeah. not a big yeah, deal. Yeah. And we get a little bit of a taste of this because the first thing that plot point that happens is that he bumps into an old mate from one of the other regiments that are on this expedition. Yeah. Um, and they go drinking in a place called the Eagles, Eagles Wing. The Eagles Wing. But it turns out as they leave the Eagles Wing, uh, they're set upon by blue faced Tau sympathizers. Yes. And almost killed. Yeah. Almost killed, but managed to escape with the help of a Kroot. Yes. That so actually says, I am Kroot. Yes. Which, yeah. yeah. So the crew are really interesting. What did you What did you reckon of the crew? Well, I, I I was like, what the hell? Like when it said in the book, it says a long, like nailed, like a Wolverine hand almost pulls them out, and then I realised that crew eat things to get their kind of trait, and I thought that was a really fun idea. This is what I'm saying about this book opening up the universe to me to understand the different races you can play mm. and their traits and abilities. Um, I thought they were awesome. I was really excited because I thought this is a cosmopolitan event, you know, we're mm -hmm. going to meet different things. After they're saved, is that when they go onto the governor's ball then? Yes, so they're saved by the Kroots, who, who's very reasonable. The Kroots going, we work for the Tau mm. because we choose to, we can work for whoever we want with the Kroot. I find the Kroot to be some of them Imperial humans are not very human. They're not very yeah. much like us. Imperial humans are all, you know, emperor bothering zealots who hate the alien and all this sort of thing. The crew are weirdly human. The crew are like, oh, yeah, okay. they're like weirdly easy to relate to. Apart from the whole eating everything thing, the cr crew are weirdly easy <laughs> to relate to. They like exist in the 40k universe going, yeah, I'm not a crazy religious zealot for that side. And no. I'm not a crazy religious zealot for that side. And I'm not worshipping that. And I'm not a crazy orc. I'm, I'm just, just I'm we're just, just, you know, going to yeah. work for whoever gives us the best food. Yeah, and, that makes um, sense. They're kind of reasonable. Yeah, they're really reasonable. <laughs> the Kroot's reasoning is, we know there's the Tau here. We know there's the Imperium here. No one wants a war right now. Mm. And these Tau sympathisers in the population killing a Commissar would look bad. Yeah, it would kick it off. The Kroot says, well, this is not for the greater good. And the yes. sympathiser goes away. That's a big theme, the <laughs> yeah. greater good. Yeah. And uh, that's like a very Tau Kroot kind of philosophy. Yeah. So then what, later on in the book, when Kane's trying to persuade various people to do things, he will say to them, it's for the greater good. And then... Yeah, he picks up on that really quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and uses it, yeah. So after we've done the drinking and the fighting set piece, which sets up a bit of like the, the planet situation, we go into the ambassador's reception. Grice, the planetary governor, who's by every description, a horrible human. Yes, um, over the top, has the whole carpet of the whole embassy hall is a woven picture of his face. Yeah, yes. Someone has stepped in a cake onto the carpet so it looks like he has a bogey yep. which I thought was a really yeah. nice touch but massively over ostentatious pallid weak looking man very much like you know um, those Roman emperors who were just the result of loads and loads and loads of breeding yeah yeah, inbreeding uh, and, um, and they go to this reception they take a little squad with them uh, who are just 
on their best behaviour. Kane notices a few things. He meets Grice. There is a singer. Yes. Uh, who he fancies. Yep. Um, long blonde hair, long blue blonde eyes, hair and, a, and a clingy dress. Yep. And he chats a bit with. And one of the things they talk about is how it's very obvious that they're the, the Inquisition are here because that guy over there pretending to be a rogue trader yes. is definitely an Inquisitor. Kane knows all about this. There, yeah, that's exactly that. what Inquisitors do, uh, which they... I think is a reference to Eisenhorn. Hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. The quote is: "Everyone knows that undercover Inquisition disguise themselves as rogue traders." Said straight to the Inquisitor, which is brilliant. Yeah. But I, I love that there are references to Eisenhorn in this. It yeah. made me feel really tucked in. And the Tau ambassador turns up, so we, we meet the Tau for the mm. first time. The Tau ambassador and their agent to turn up and then the town ambassador is shot and yeah. everything goes to hell no one knows sees who did it they try and block off the exits then they realize they have to get the towel they just need to get the towel out because yeah. as soon as the town ambassador is shot people start rebelling mm. people are suddenly up in arms and no one knows who told who yeah who did well, it actually i think kane transmits on an open channel <laughs> And he goes, someone's taken out the tower, <laughs> ambassador. And then he's like, uh-oh. Now everyone, And it kicks off. So everything's gone to shit. The city's suddenly rebellion, rebelling. It's very dangerous. And the best bet they've got is to get the Tau back to their yes. enclosure. The Tau try and send a vehicle to extract the ambassador. And the um, vehicle's shot down by a yeah. missile launcher. So suddenly Kane's like, well, hold on a minute. Yeah. The civilian insurgents seem to have a lot of weapons. Yes. They steal a truck yeah. and they go and they get the towel back to their encampment. There's a group of PDF who try and stop them yeah. because they're sheltering a towel. Still and can't they... get over planetary defence force being a PDF. Being a PDF, yeah. Uh, the, um, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and, the, and they have to shoot the PDF. They have to shoot the PDF. But also this marks the bit in the book where it becomes more than just war stories. It's now a murder mystery. Yes. Because they can't figure out who shot the ambassador. There's no... They can't find the sniper or anything. They just have to hustle the Tau out of there. Yeah, they the Tau back. They go back to the city and they do like a war council with Zyban. So Grice at this point is going, Grice is the governor, is going, you need to deploy the garden to the city because there's so much unrest. Yeah. Zyban rightly says, well, if we do that, there's more chance of a war with the Tau. We do not have the resources for a war with the Tau. Yeah. Um, what are we going to do? And the decision is that the Valhallans will deploy the, the 597th, his regiment, yeah. um, because the Tau now trusts Commissar Kane. Because he saved the Tau. Yeah. yeah. And what they're going to do is they're going to deploy into the areas of the city that are the most Tau um, sympathetic and they're going to sort of quell unrest amongst the Tau sympathisers, bolster the PDF and go into town. So they, they lead this big deployment, mm. um, which I think you hear about from, from a really... It's another example of the framing device. You hear about what happened in this from an extremely tersely written after battle report from yeah. Brocklaw, who doesn't like writing reports and is only <laughs> doing the bare minimum of details. Yeah. I love that device. Yeah. And that means we don't have to read through a whole <laughs> Yeah, so you don't well. see it. In the, because in the meantime, of course, Kane finds a way to avoid this. He says, well, look, it's only a load of civilians. You guys can handle this. You don't need me around. What I would do is there's something weird. There's like this refinery that the PDF have cordoned off. Mm. I'm just going to go and investigate just in case the PDF needs some help bolstering things. Yeah. That looks a bit weird to me. Yeah. And goes to investigate this little um, PDF yeah. thing as a way of shirking his, Any yeah. actual fighting. No danger. Yeah. We should also say in all these negotiations where you have, you know, the Imperium coming together, they drink a lot of tea. Yes. Tana tea is must have been written in this book about 50 times yeah. and made me drink about 30 cups as I was reading. So one of the influences they always talk about about this is Flashman. Flashman's kind of the opposite of Kane. Flashman thinks he's a brilliant hero, but is in fact a colossal coward. Yeah. Whereas Kane is the same sort of writing and the same tone of voice, mm. but Kane is very clear that he's a massive coward. Yes. But accidentally always ends up being the hero. He's he's surprisingly competent. Yeah. So and I think there's an awful lot of this like <laughs> You're not gonna make me British <laughs> public school, like flashman, British, tea, rugby, the school he got trained Jolly in at basically good. boarding school. Like there's an awful lot of this uh, <laughs> Imperial ambition, British Empire. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's that. Yeah, you get a really good flavour of that. And it's a bit weird because obviously the Valhallen regiment he's in. Did you look up Valhallens on, on this to see what they look like? I'll no. show you what Valhallens look like. Wow. I mean, that they look similar to people who play military games from yeah, our mean, history. They're very obviously based on like World War One, World War Two Russians. Just with more skulls on their uniforms. Despite the fact that his regiment are all space, these Valhallens. Mm. Um, uh, he, they've managed to wangle in a way in which everyone drinks lots and lots of tea. Yeah. Um, uh, which of course is a big Russian thing as well. Yeah. And uh, and so it means that you can get this like 
yeah, you can get all that Flashman stuff in. Yeah. So um, what is this weird building hiding? He goes to investigate the building. It turns out the building is uh, a load of fire starts coming from the building because the Inquisitor, the Inquisitor, who everyone is assuming is the road trader, Aurelius, mm. the Inquisitor has shut it down. Um, he ends up um, accidentally setting fire to the building. And then realises that if it's his fault that the Inquisitor is burned to death, that'll be really bad for him. Yep. So he's going to have to go and save them. Yeah. <laughs> at which point Jür Jürgen does his first first go at um, crazy Jürgen driving, which is another thing that happens oh, yes. throughout the books. Jürgen crazy is an insane Jürgen driving. driver um, in their little salamander tank yes. that they like driving around in. Salamander tank. Annoying thing to Google. Yes. Because if you Google 40k salamanders. Everything is a salamander in 40k. Green armour. Yeah. Yep. 40k doesn't have enough words is a running thing in 40k. Yeah. Like the same words are used to describe 10 different books and yeah. 15 different models. Salamander just about Helens? No, any, any, any Imperial any God Imperial you might have it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, they rescue the Inquisitor. A lot of people get killed. They manage to rescue Aurelius, who they think is the Inquisitor. Yes. And then they rescue the Inquisitor, who turns out to be Amberly, the... The singer from the, the singer Governor's from the, Ball. Yeah, Governor's Ball and the writer of the memoirs. Yes. So that editor... If you listen to the audio book... It's a woman's voice and it is her. Yeah. And that is the editor's voice. And as the book goes on, once she's revealed to be the editor, the footnotes get a lot more snarky, funny, <laughs> eye rolly. Yeah. Really interesting shift up. Yeah. Amberly has this little gang of, you know, inquisitorial followers, like all inquisitors do, yeah. as we are familiar with from Eisenhorn. One of them is a direct Eisenhorn reference. She has a savant called Caractacus Mott, yeah. who's Uber Amos. Uber Amos in a new incarnation, pretty much. Yeah. And then she also has a uh, psyker called Raquel. Yeah. So Raquel is bonkers. Yeah. But also um, never, always dresses in clothes that are too small, is really yes. always inappropriately dressed and has a really whining nasal voice. In my head, Raquel is Janice from Friends. <laughs> Oh that's, my god! Yeah, I think that's what Raquel is, <laughs> but could also be <laughs> could also be Raquel from Only Fools and Horses, yeah. Hellboy's girlfriend. Yeah, which that, is what I re I saw when I read it. Yeah, Raquel when she gets near Jürgen freaks, freaks out. out. Yes, that was maybe when I realised Jürgen's a blank. Yeah, so that's how we know Jürgen's a blank. That's Obviously, how we Kane know. doesn't know yet, and yeah. yeah, rescues the Inquisitor, goes back to base, and then decides he's going to go drinking again because back his world has wing. been shaken um, by this, and he didn't. He almost died, so he goes back to the Eagle's Wing on his own. Where there's a really lovely scene where Amberly then walks in. He's really worried, yeah, because she might be a psycho. Yes, it's a brilliant moment where she kind of tells him, I think you're this, this and this. And he's like, oh, how does she know everything? And she goes, don't worry, I'm not a psyker. I can just read you like that. Yeah. So really brilliant that he's kind of met his match. Yeah. He's all about manipulation and holding himself to this thing. And then she's like, don't worry, I get you. I see you. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. really great. I love that scene. She then basically takes him out of the pub and takes him back to another war meeting. Yeah. Amberly then basically reveals the plot, which yes. is that she's she thinks there's something more dangerous going on. It's not just Tower and Imperium, and they need to go into the Undercity to um, investigate because Amberly was just, just starting to investigate things, yeah. and then they started getting fired at and met by resistance. They don't know who it was. It's also the scene of foreshadowing. Like, Amberly hints that it might be gene stealers, See, I or, completely missed that. There's but, some hinting here. There's a lot yeah. of foreshadowing, which you as a reader realise, but Kane doesn't pick up on yet. No. It, and there's a point where Kane does realise what the fuck they're going after yeah. and is very scared because he's fought Tyranids before. Yeah, it really annoys me. On page 315, we realise she did know that. And I was like, why, if in a military operation, is there any excuse for not saying... By the way, Kane, we're going up against Tyranids. Maybe pack weapons we know are effective. <laughs> Maybe use these tactics. And then I was like, oh my God, I'm becoming a Warhammer person. Yeah. That made me feel quite yeah. good about myself. <laughs> also, this represents a change in tone again. So we've gone from battle, murder mystery. We're now in Alien. Really brilliant, spooky horror. And my reading got faster then because it's really tense. Two thirds of the way through the book. And we sort of go into like this... Yeah, this mission, this like yeah. special oper operations mission. Essentially, what happens in the War Council is all of her bodyguards are dead. So she needs a team of guard to go with her. Yeah. Um, she's already read the reports of what happened on the ship. So she insists that it's the group of penal penal legion people <laughs> who legion have been, been uh, separated <laughs> out for a suicide mission. Yes. Which Kane is like, all right, so it's that dangerous then. Fine. Yeah, are you but... sure? And then goes, and brilliant, the commissar will be coming with me. Not only that, Kane is like, I don't want to come because those five prisoners all want, want to, to kill me. <laughs> so that's Kelp, Trebek, v Velade, Sorrel and uh, Hollenby. 
All yeah. very kind of alien sounding names. They're also, they are the cast of Aliens. We get these five people, they get an arming up sequence, they get fancy guns yes. and fancy armour. Which actually comes into play. It's yeah. an arming sequence that comes into play later, which I thought, yeah, bow down to that. <laughs> very, very good. We also get a nice little exchange there where someone's like, well, what's to stop us just shooting you and leaving? Oh, yes. And then the answer the is, well, you could do that, but then the Inquisition would hunt you down. Yeah. And they're like, okay, you can live. <laughs> And I love that the Inquisition is hardcore. Yeah, like, it's really terrifying to everyone in the book. <laughs> Either become an Inquisitor or just do what they say. And it's why I think a lot of people really like that character, Amberly Vale, is a really <laughs> nice character because the entire outward appearance of Amberly Vale is quite a jolly 30-something woman yeah. who's just quite, quite, quite Sings, fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then occasionally comes out with terrifying lines. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting the whole way through the book, she acts as this really, you know, gorgeous, you know, quite ch charismatic woman. Mm. But all the footnotes and asides are like, she's a killer. You know, <laughs> she's cold as ice. She don't mess with this woman. So they go into the Undercity. Um, it's very scary. They go down and there's a lot of them references to Kane having Kane knowing his way around because he grew yes. up in the Hive world. I love that. Another thing I learned, Hive planets, where you kind of grow up in an underground system. And, mm. you know, I really love that. And he has a great sense of direction underground as a result of this. Yeah, which is a plot point a lot of times to get him out of trouble. We go into this mission sequence. We find out again through um, really badly written reports from Sulla that they that the army above are having a big fight. They're, yeah. they're, they're trying not to fight the Tau. They're driving through in the tower, blowing up PDF transports, but mm. trying to avoid blowing up Imperial Guard transports. This is all going on through after action reports, mm. but our, our point of view is always with Kane, Amberley and his yeah. little gang. As they go down the tunnels, they get into a little firefight and they realise that the, who's been sent into the tunnels are the Tau and the Crutes that Kane met earlier. The crew are an auxiliary to Tau, so they've been hired yeah. in, so they're acting as a little team. And I, I don't know where, somewhere along the, the, you find out that the Tau were told to come down here by Grice. Yes. So there's some suspicion, like, why is Grice telling them to come down here? When they realise around the same time that they discover this other force, they're like, oh my God, there are Tyranids down here. There now, are, specifically, there are gene stealers down genes, here. Genes, sorry. Yeah, so there's a, they, they so discover yeah. um, after some um, some bits involving the crew not wanting to eat them because they taste corrupted. Yes, yeah. the best reveal ever. Yeah, the, uh, they know that they're gene stealers. Kane suspects they're gene stealers and the Kane and Amberley have this conversation and don't tell the rest of the team because it would scare them too much. Kane suspects they're gene stealers because the crew won't eat them. The crew says eats a bit of human, spits it out, and then they go, why did you spit it out? And they go, because their DNA was messed with. And you're like, <gasps> so the gene stealers, they're here. Basically, they realise that the gene stealers are underground. They don't know how many of them there are. They have mm. to kind of explain what they are to Tau. Yeah. Tau don't know what they are. Um, Which is helpful for people like me reading this book. But also, I should say, I don't know if any of you have watched you and I playing that game. That you Lost made. Patrol. Lost yeah. Patrol. But in that game, Ian asked me to play the scouts who cannot win yeah. against the gene stealers so i kind of knew how big and bad they were yeah yeah when we started playing um the plot that is revealed in this sequence is that all along grice was part of the cult lots of the pdf and citizens are part of the cult yeah. and the cult has been trying to make the town and the imperial guard go to war mm. to destabilize the planet so it's easier for tyranids to invade a long-winded way of doing it and, and briefly they go down jürgen's telepathy d disrupts the brood so they, they don't get attacked as much and the tau get attacked a lot more yes amberly and kane are separated from the rest of the gang yes and make their way up to the surface again with this information all they need to do is find it and get back yeah find themselves in the governor's palace and kill the governor yes and Ju it's revealed that the governor shot the person at the beginning with a third arm yeah from his tummy yeah yeah with his third so gene stealer his arm. third gene stealer yeah. arm. this is why it would be a tau and not a gene stealer yeah, don't be a gene stealer okay don't be a gene stealer um <laughs> So they kill the governor just at the time that all the uh, Valhallans turn up uh, in the palace anyway, because they were storming the palace. Jürgen turns up at the end yeah. to save everyone's life with his melter gun. Yeah. Jürgen, of course, immune to, could just walked out of the tunnels because none of the gene stealers can see him because yeah. he's a block in their mind. Um, and at the very end, we see the rest of the team emerge. Uh, the survivors of the team emerge, but Kane notices that they have oh, little marks I on them, no, which no, are no. gene stealer... Kane doesn't notice that. What Kane notices is there are two of them, Valade and Hollenby, and they come out and they're holding hands. And that's kind of cute because they've kind of had this burgeoning romance. But he, uh, Kane says, what happened to you? And they go, oh, we don't remember. We were fighting and then we're here. And Kane and Amberly look at each other and just... 
shoot them. And everyone's like, why did you do that? They survived. Kane goes, don't worry. Look at their ribs. And, and oh, goes, they've got, they've got oh, a yeah. wound. And he pulls out from inside their tummy where the gene stealer have put this implant to kind of do what you were describing. Yeah. Now, why didn't he just say, could you put up your vests? <laughs> I think there's a gene stealer in you. Let's operate <laughs> and take it out. Because he's, it costs a lot of money to train a space marine. Yeah, but they're not space marines. They're just disposable grunts. Oh, that's fine. Yeah, yeah. they're just disposable soldiers. I mean, it wouldn't have been as an ad, a dramatic reveal. You know, like the hand comes out from the grave yeah. in carry. You have to shoot these guys. But I would have said, I think you might have been infected. Let's <laughs> yeah. have a look. This is probably the only bit of the whole thing where he acts more like a normal commissar i mean you know with covid and everything yeah <laughs> no we shouldn't leave that in so yeah that's the plot i almost think like it's not about the plot like no. it's a series of set piece engagements for you to watch these silly characters yeah. have fun it is a great joy to read because there's so many layers and they're trying to engage you and make you laugh there's things like um uh, Jürgen has this huge melter gun and they're like oh get the marshmallows Jürgen and he's like why and like he's so dumb he doesn't get and then he's like oh to toast the marshmallows there's just there's a lot of funny bits there's like um when he's saying oh I can speak loads of languages I can even speak a bit of orcish which seems to be mostly gestures and blows to the head <laughs> so a lot of the text is played for laughs which is so good because I was so worried it would be like I maneuvered my flank to the left and yeah. you know and there is a bit of that. There are action scenes and fight scenes yeah. and think and there is intrigue and imperial thing. It's just undercut all the time yeah. by someone but by by a character who does not take the world seriously that they exist in. Yeah. And it's great. It's great having three different eyes, you yeah. know, three different perspectives. The other thing I loved about this book, there are three really strong women in it throughout. Yes. You get Castine, Amberly, the Inquisitor, and you get Lieutenant Sulla. Yes. And this was in 2003, and I know the internet was in its infancy, but I wonder were there like really ranty men on forums? Like, what know. are there three? Why know, is there an all female company? Yeah. It wouldn't happen. So, yeah. I mean, this has been. This has been a thing since 2003, and I just loved it. It wasn't like she was a woman and she was strong. It was just like these were characters and, in really embedded and just doing their thing. And it's what I was saying at the start as well about Kane mostly sizes them all up based on how attractive they are. Like he doesn't mention, yeah. mention Sulla without mentioning that she looks like a horse, which would be a terrible book, except for the fact that you're meant yeah. to be looking at Kane and going... You're, yeah, you're, you're not, not meant to be sympathising totally with Kane in no, this. Yeah, yeah you're right. It, uh, all, he does say, oh, she was a, a stunning redhead if you liked redheads, that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah. So, yeah, but I did, I love that the they had really good agency. They pushed the plot along. Yeah, it was really great. After our last ones, I was thinking about this when I was reading it. Everything in this book is in the game. If you don't know what it looks like, Yay. you can Google it. Yes. It's, it's in the game. The, the permanent question from all the Eisenhorn books, like, is that in the game? And I'll be like, no, no because it's set on a grain silo and yeah. they don't have those in the game. See, Dan um, Abnett's imagination is even bigger than the 40K universe. <laughs> Terrifying. So, well, he's, he's writing stories where all of his characters are going backstage. So he's had to make up what is in the backstage. Yeah. So, so many of the things that Eisenhorn encounters just aren't playable factions in the game because they're like the space police in the city yeah. or something. Whereas here, it's in a battlefield. Yeah. So even though there are Inquisitors, everything in it yeah. is like directly pulled from the game. Well, I know that a lot of you, your favourite bits is when I quiz Ian on <laughs> yeah. everything. So I've done some lists. All right. Ian's okay. going to talk us through some of the vehicles and uh, weaponry that shows up okay. in the book. Okay, all right. So the first thing is Trojan heavy haulers. So, so right. So we need, we need to start here with actually chimeras or chimeras or Ch what have you want yes, to Yes, chimeras. Them. Chimeras are like this standard troop transport tank okay. uh, that the Imperial Guard use. They look like this. They just look like a tank with yeah. a snow shovel. Yeah, it's like a, it's like okay. a little guns down the side for the people inside to shoot out. Carries a squad of people. They're the standard tra troop transport from Imperial Guard. And the regiment Kane is attached to have loads of them. They're an armoured regiment. Yeah. They, they deploy in these Chimeras. Then, this is really common in 40k, the way they make other vehicles is they take the Chimera chassis yeah. and then they just like modify it to not be a troop transport. So they'll take the troop transport off the back and put artillery on the back of it and that's a basilisk. Okay. A salamander is a Chimera but like a scout version. And the same thing with the Trojan Heavy Hauler. So a Trojan Heavy Hauler is another one of these rare, rare tanks where um, it's a Chimera, but it's set up to like 
tow artillery and lift things. That's so interesting. Yeah. Do you reckon there's a bit of Games Workshop doing that because it helps with the modelling? Yeah, that's exactly the reason. <laughs> They're like, great, we can make the basic tank here and then we just make a selection of different sprues that go on oh. top of it. And that's how loads of 40k armies work. And the argument for it is 40k, they've forgotten all this technology, so they've basically figured out what the most efficient tank is and then just put different things on the back of it. I love and there that. is a bit of that. Like, that happens in the real world to a certain yeah. degree. But yeah, in 40k, it's endemic because it makes modelling a lot easier. Yeah, yay yeah. yeah, for the kit bashers. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, so then uh, what, the next thing is an Earthshaker howitzer. Earthshaker howitzer is a great big artillery gun. Uh, and if you put one on the back of the tank, it's called a basilisk. That's Amazing. a Shimura with an, a, a Chimera with an Earthshake on it. Okay, so I'm going to want one of those. Um, the next thing is a Lehman Russo. A Lehman Russ. A Lehman Russ, sorry. It is a tank. It's the, <laughs> again, same thing. Standard tank of the, of the Imperial Guard. Okay. Every Imperial Guard regiment has them. They're just a tank. If I show you one, you're just going to go, that's a tanky tank. Okay, great. Yeah. Well, I think that's all the, uh, the transport taken care of. So then we've got <laughs> some great weaponry in this. Right. Frag grenade. So it's a grenade, it's a normal grenade like you would expect oh. a grenade to do. Like fr it fragments and sends shrapnel everywhere. Oh my God, frag is short for frag. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, good. I mean, not obvious. No, 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 but yeah, a fragmentation grenade. Okay, what's a crack missile? Uh, so crack is the opposite to frag. A frag, a frag missile, because you can get frag missiles as well. Okay. Frag in 40k means explodes and spreads explodey shit everywhere. Okay. So there's loads of shrapnel and it hurts lots of people. Yeah. Crack is the opposite. It's used to crack armour oh. and it's an implosion. So it's a single okay. small implosion. So okay. it fires at something, there's an implosion which cracks the armour open. I, I don't know if that's actually how physics works, but in 40k, <laughs> crack yeah. refers to armour piercing weapons which... Yeah. Explode armour. I like that. Crack makes sense. Okay. Um, we've covered dreadnoughts, haven't we? One thing that I really like in this book, which you reminded me of, is that uh, although everything in the book is in the game, yeah. they don't go down the route of everyone in the book knowing what they're called in the game. Yeah. So all the Tau vehicles and all the Tau battle suits they see floating around have names, yeah. but none of the Imperial Guard know them. So they just talk about them as these weird Xenotech floating tanks. Yes. And whenever the guardsmen see Tau battle suits, which is the standard way Tau fight. Ooh. Yeah. So yeah. that's a little Tau in there. It's really big. So whenever they see these Tau battle suits, what they call them is Tau dreadnoughts, because the closest thing they can think of is the dreadnought space marines <gasps> use. That's I, I really like that in this. It doesn't go to the point of going, oh, Kane saw a devilfish tank flying over the city because Kane doesn't know what that's called. He's yeah. like, oh, it's one of those weird Tau floating things. I love that. That's a great detail. Yeah. Um, rail guns, I know from the expanse, basically yeah. like a bandolier goes through a gun it, and shoots loads of them at the same time. It's it's like, a, I think the official, the because they're a real thing, I think, or a thing that's been theorised about that could be built in the future. I'm not sure. But the idea of the rail gun is it's a, an, a magnetic accelerator, accelerates a bullet faster than anything else would be able to, faster than an explosion would be able wow. to, which means they go through anything. Yeah. yeah. But for some reason, the tower, the only people in 40k who yes. have them, and they're really devastating. Overpowered. Discuss in the comments. <laughs> and then this was my favourite weapon. A digital needler. So right at the end, you know, like, Kane's about to die, and the Inquisitor yeah. goes, like, points... A digital needler. Yeah. Digital meaning finger. Yes, that's that's the thing no one gets. Me. Good, well done for getting that, because people forget about that. Um, so a needler is a gun that shoots little crystals of toxin. Okay. So it's like an assassin's weapon in yeah. 40k, like snipers might have it or specialist units might have it. Yeah. In Eisenhorn, his pilot, Midas, has a needle rifle. Okay. And a needle pistol. And what they are, they're meant to be very delicate weapons, and they, they shoot this little dart, which is crystallised poison, mm -hmm. which then incapacitates people. Digital weapons are a thing that high-ranking people in the Imperium have, and they're in the game. Weapons in rings. Secret weapons oh. in rings, because they go on your finger, so they're digital. But I'm interested, like, why would you choose, if you were playing a game, why would you choose, for example, a needle gun yeah. over... Rifles or... Um, you tend to find that the people who have them are like scouts that are in are infiltrated and are hiding in bushes. Okay. So no one knows who they are because they make no sound. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the reason you might... Inquisitors and things would have them built into ornate rings is so that it looks like they haven't got a weapon yeah. when they're at their function. But actually, ah. they've got this last ditch weapon where they can just laser you or... Fl there's digital flamers and digital lasers and digital needlers. Yeah. They're yeah. still dangerous. Okay. Yeah. The crew help the Tau... Are they helping because they want to, or are they brainwash? Because the Tau can apparently brainwash. Yeah, so oh, you've been doing some backstory. Yeah, so there is... The, well, no one really knows. So the Tau are this um, 
like in 40k, no one's completely good. As I said before, the yeah. tower kind of the closest. I think I said this to Emmy in the candle review. The tower like the closest thing maybe too good. Okay. In the in the setting, um, but they're also portrayed as being very naive. Okay. Because they're in 40k. The tower have these five these casts: mm. uh, earth, air, fire, and water, which do different jobs. And those casts are ruled over by a different cast called the Ethereals, who Imperials seem to think must be mind controlling the rest of the oh, tower because okay. that's why they work so well together. Whether that is true, yeah. or whether that is, if you're Imperial, the only way you can explain people working together. Mm, it's brainwashing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it must be brainwashed. It must be brainwashing them, because why would all these Tau work together yeah. without control by fear and oppression? The Tau have lots of, um, as they expanded, they've uh, subsumed other alien races into their um, empire. They're never like first-class citizens. They're always second-class citizens. Interesting. There is questions over whether the Tau, w what that deal is. Okay. It, on the face of it, they're just they're just an empire that isn't xenophobic, but are the Tau controlling them somehow? We don't mm. know. The Crute though are almost certainly not being controlled by the Tau. The Crute are going. You'll let us fight for you, and we'll get new genetic material. I think the Crute's ideas, which are um, all we care about, is uh, is um, preserving the Crute through us sampling the biggest genetic material so we can yeah. survive. Um, works quite well with what the Tau want to do, which is expand and get everyone yeah. into their empire. The crew are not mind controlled by the Tau. They're, no. they're allies of convenience. And there used to be things in 40k where you could take a Crute army just on its own as mercenaries for any other Ooh, species. Yes, the, cool. yeah, on the fringes of the Imperium where, yeah. the, where the rules can't quite as, uh, you know, in Tatooine Imperium yeah. land, where the rules <laughs> quite aren't quite as well enforced. There might be crew mercenaries working yeah. for human governments, or which of course would mean the human government would all be murdered if the Inquisition <laughs> found out. You know, there, yeah, there, yeah, there's yeah. a lot of that around. I, I prefer that. Let's go with that theory that it's a symbiotic, helpful relationship and they're not being brain controlled. Um, <laughs> yeah. Last two questions. Are there any Tau books? And do we know anyone that plays a Tau army? I used to have a Tau army. Uh, and then I got rid of it because I um, got bored of it. They're one of those things that was introduced quite late to 40k. Like 40k had been around for 20 years when yeah. they introduced Tau. And you can see from the design of them, they were introduced to sort of appeal to anime fans. Because they're... Yeah, they're, they're, hence they're, me loving them. Yeah, they're, they're sort of giant mecha. They're quite new, which means that they... As always happens when new things happen in 40k, there was a section of, the, even back in 2003 when Tower were introduced, there was a se section of the fan base that went, oh, you're changing it. Yeah. yeah. Um, now, then they've gone through periods where they've been very popular and periods where they're not very popular. Yeah. I mean, you tend to find that the Xenos armies in 40k, you either find people really, really like them or really don't. Okay. With the exception of Orcs, which everybody likes. Makes sense. Yeah. And there's no Tau books? I think there are some Tau books. I think there's Tau books about some of the big Tau heroes. There are books okay. about, but I haven't read any. But we could, if you wanted to, investigate a Tau book. We should. Maybe we should ask for recommendations, because I haven't read any of the Tau books. I know. We do need to do the thing at the end where we ask for recommendations. Um, so, did you enjoy it? I did enjoy it. And I read it twice, oh. because we had quite a long break. And the second reading, I enjoyed so much more. I really felt like it helped me get into touch with the Warhammer universe and understand mm -hmm. the dynamics and also how how it would be if you were like having to work with Inquisitors and stuff. And yeah, also I I love that the Tyranids are a really scary enemy. Yeah. Um, I would like to read more Kane, especially if you see people repeating from yeah. the cast because I was devastated that we lost five of them. I really wanted to see that ragtaggle mm -hmm. crew going on. And I would love it if these new the other Kane books have that similar mixing of different cultures because mm -hmm. I really enjoyed that. Cool. How Brilliant. about you? I really enjoy. I remember reading. I've read a lot of the Kane books. I haven't read all of them, and I really enjoyed reading it again. It's a really easy read. Yes, it like is. it's it's really like straight through. You're, yeah. You can read it really fast. It's it's very fun to read. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It, and, and I and I got into the bits where I was like. Dreading the bits where Sulla has to write, like I meant to yes. be. Like I got to those bits, I was like, oh God, now I'm going to have to read Sulla. Yeah. It was it's actually, brilliant. I mean, I was kind of like, oh, Kane, you are Wally. But I wasn't like furious at any of the characters. No. I was just like, it was really interesting to learn about them all. And I think Kane's placed really well for that. Like, yeah. Like he is in many ways horrible. Yes. But you kind of like him. Yeah. You, you want him to succeed and you want him to, you know, not die. Yeah, so, yeah. Much much more likeable than, say, Eisenhorn. Definitely so much more likeable than Eisenhorn, especially at the end of those books <laughs> where he's just killing all his friends. Yeah. But yeah. Let's have a look at what we might do next time. So we did this as like a palette cleanser after three Eisenhorn books and two Beckwin books. Uh, obviously, we can't do the third Beckwin book because it's not there yet. Not yet. Um, we could 
go straight through and go, that was the original plan. We're going to go through and we'll do Ravenna, I guess, next. Or I believe somehow you've come across a list of books that you've <laughs> been looking at well, potentially I, to read. I do hear from people after I've come and done these videos. So one is On A Bound. Uh, yeah, so that's a uh, Sever... I've not read On A Bound. So Severina Rain um, is another commissar. I think possibly more of the normal sort of... Com I don't think that's going to have any of the humour in it. Okay. I think that's very much a like Imperial Guard war... I'm a badass commissar and I kill yeah. people sort of thing. Okay. Um, so that is that is like an Imperial Guard book, yeah. Then Mark of Faith. Adeptus Sororitas books. And Mark of Faith is one of the older ones, maybe? Okay. I haven't read either of the Adeptus Sororitas books. Okay. The Adeptus Sororitas are like space battle nuns. Yes. So they're really, <laughs> really religious. Oh, and God. only fighting for the for the glory of the emperor, yeah. which has always slightly t th made me go, well, that's a boring thing to fucking write, <laughs> read about, isn't it? So I've never really gone into it. Um, yeah. uh, obviously, vast majorities of the characters will be very strong women who yes. also happen to be um, extremely religious, pious, <laughs> zealous nuns. I mean, so how you feel about that? I'm not. Yeah, it's up to you. We could do that. I don't know if you've read any of the Mark Lawrence books, um, but they're all about this uh, monastery of like highly trained and magical ass kicking nuns. <laughs> so I'm quite into that vibe. Okay. Um, not 40k, just amazing fantasy novels. And then um, Spear of the Emperor, which is from the point of view of Below Stairs. So it's so Yeah, Spear of the Emperor, I would say, is probably, if you actually want to read a book about space marines having a fight, which is what most 40k books are about. You keep saying that, yeah. Sp Spear of the Emperor is probably the best one. Okay. As in, it's set very up to date in 40k. Yeah. I mean, it is a war story. It's not, it's not like a comedy or a mystery. Okay. It's a, it's a fight. The, the, the setup is... Um, in modern 40k there's a division in the galaxy uh, one marine goes to basically spring news to this chapter of marines that have been that have been isolated for ages okay and um, it's a very like when they wake the Klingons up in Star Trek it, yes <laughs> yeah um, yeah uh, it's exactly like that the specific marine that goes to spring this news is from a chapter where he each marine has some human servants who have to serve that marine and keep him, you know, uh, record like, his um, battles. Like Jurgen, and maybe. Kind of, yeah, yeah. Without without the humor. One of the big things in forty k is that there's so many different marine chapters that they all have quite different cultures. Yeah. And so you see all these different cultures of different marine chapters. See that I would like probably like that aspect of it. But I mean, so that's the choice. The choice. What is the next Ravenna book? So the first Ravenna is called Ravenna. Okay, Ravenna. And, and it is it is it carries on with a lot of the characters from Eisenhorn. Yeah. So Eisenhorn by that point's gone. Ravenna now had like Nail and Kara and people like that all yeah. now work for um work for Ravenna. Yeah. And Ravenna goes on his own adventure, which is another three part inquisitorial mega story, although it isn't single point of view. Okay. It's, um, chapter by it, chapter, it's, yeah. viewpoint by viewpoint. No, no, it's it's much more. It's written like a normal novel. It's not. It's not like Game of Thrones where they change viewpoint every chapter. Okay. It's it's just you you just follow many many characters. Okay. Yeah. Wow, normal book. Like a normal okay. book. Yeah. Okay, so either that one or we're going to go on a bound or Mark of Faith or Spear of the Emperor, and you are going to decide. Okay, fine. That's what we're going to do. Then that's what we're doing. Yeah. Ravenna or something new. We could, of course, do another cane book. Yes. But okay. That's... that's the other option, which is the only is the only funny option here. Like Patreons, where we'll do the vote. Patreon. Um, and if people have opinions, they can put them anywhere they like. But Yay. but the vote we will take is the one that happens on Patreon. Cool. Because I feel like we uh, promised this before Christmas, and yes. then I, and I actually got people on other videos now going, "When's the book club?" <laughs> if you'd like Ian and I to play games together, let us know. What games though? What like I'll teach you actual Warhammer. Yeah. Fucking hell. <laughs> I'll be Taos. We right, could do a skirmish. Right. Well, maybe we'll, yeah, we could do that. We could do Kill Team. <laughs> but also, I'm going to get tips. One, if we decide to do this, I will get tips from everyone in the comments and kick your ass. <laughs> Fine. Great. That's what we're going to do. Um, thanks, Mira. Uh, thanks, sorry Ian. this took so long. That is the first Kai F.S. Kane book. Kai yeah. F.S. Kane book. We'll return in a few weeks with another, whichever one gets voted for. Okay? Yay. Cool. Thanks. Bye.